So now what we're going to do is go through the phases of meiosis. And like I said, you'll be happy to see that a lot of them look familiar to you because they have the same names as the phases of mitosis. And they are very similar. There's going to be a couple of differences I'll show you here and there. So the first phase is going to be prophase one. And I've got a little video here that we can take a look at that kind of shows you what's going to happen in prophase one. So here you can see that the DNA is going to be condensing into the chromosome. So we're going into the nucleus right now. And that's the spindle fibers they were just showing. So here we've got the DNA that's going to be condensing into those chromosomes. Now these are homologous chromosomes and they're going to be associated with one another and they can do the crossing over. And you can tell where crossing over has happened like right here because you can see that where there used to be red now there's blue and vice versa. So now the nuclear envelope is going to dissolve and the next thing that's going to happen is those homologous chromosomes are going to meet over, meet up with each other, do that crossing over, and then towards the end they're going to start to line up down the middle. So now you can see that the microtubules are kind of pulling them back and forth and eventually it's going to try and line them up in the middle. So that's going to be prophase one. So a couple of things that's going to happen. When you saw those homologous chromosomes becoming closely associated with one another, that's called synapsis. And what's going to hold them together is a big thing of protein called a synaptonemal complex. And anywhere that they had crossing over happen, that's going to be called the chiasmata. So I have some pictures of that on here. Okay, so here's our prophase one. You can see the homologous chromosomes have lined up with one another and that's going to be the synapsis and anywhere where crossing overs happen there's a little chiasmata. Now if you look at this next slide here this is a real picture that's kind of showing the little bridges where those crossing over um, parts happen. Okay, so once crossing over is complete the homologous chromosomes are going to be released from the envelope like we saw in the end of that little video clip and they're going to move away from one another. So at this point, there are four chromatids for each type of chromosome. So for example, if we said chromosome number one, there are four versions of that that are going to be present. If we go back to this, right here, there's one, two, three, four versions for chromosome number one. Okay, so that's what that's talking about. Now, another thing that's going to be important is those chromatids are not going to separate completely all four of those. One way is the two sister chromatids which are the identical versions of one another. Those are held together by the centromere, that little dot that's on the inside. And then the paired homologous chromosomes are held together at all of those chiasmata wherever that crossing over happens. Okay, so another thing that's going to happen is right before metaphase, those chiasmata are going to move towards the ends of the chromosomes. So like if these two had crossing over happen, they're going to move to down here and up here. It's going to be where you're going to see those chiasmata migrate down to. Uh, let's see, where is that slide? Yeah. Okay, so the next phase that we're going to talk about is going to be metaphase one. So here's metaphase one right here. So um, you can see that the homologous chromosomes are still lined up next to each other. Now what I want to point out to you is how this is different from mitosis and I have a very good slide to show you that and that is this one right here. So now if you look at metaphase, this on the left is going to be what metaphase looks like for mitosis. What you want to know is that there is just one chromosome. They're in a perfect line all the way down. Now look over here at meiosis. In meiosis you've got two next to each other in a line all the way down. Okay and the microtubules are only attached to one side of this red one right here and they're only attached to one side of this blue one right here. So when these microtubules pull away, it's going to pull this entire set of red ones over here and this entire set of blue ones over here. Okay, so that's another difference. Remember in metaphase and mitosis, it's actually going to split sister chromatids apart. Here, it's splitting homologous chromosomes apart, but the sister chromatids are going to stay together. Okay, all right, so metaphase one, chromosomes are going to line up along the metaphase plate, just like you learned before, um, and then what's going to happen is those microtubules are going to attach to each, um, to one side of each centromere. Okay, so let's look at our little animation and see how metaphase is going to look. 
So now we've got them lining up right down the center of the cell. And you can see the microtubules are attaching to only one side of each. Now this next phase is anaphase. Now, what's going to happen here is if you look, the red one only has that connection on one side. And so what's going to happen is all of this red is going to go over to this side and this blue one is going to go over to this side. Right? So that's different from mitosis. So that's going to be anaphase 1. Let's look at the notes. So the microtubules are shortening, pulling the homologous pairs apart. And what's going to happen is one homologous pair is going to go to one side, one homologous pair is going to the other side, but the sister chromatids are not separating, they're still together. Now, one thing that can happen at this point is something called independent assortment. And that's this right here. So if you look at this, the way that they are going to line up on that metaphase plate, there's a lot of different arrangements, right? This is only showing with two chromosomes, but you could see how with 23 sets, how that could look. And so what's going to happen is if they are different when they line up for metaphase like that, eventually what you're going to end up with is different types of cells with different combinations. And that is how you end up with siblings where one may look a lot more like the mom and one might look a lot more like the dad. And that's because of this independent assortment that can happen here. Okay? So, independent assortment we just talked about. Okay. Last part is going to be telophase 1. And telophase 1 is really simple and it's actually very similar to um, our other one that we were talking about. Um, and so, you're just going to have the nuclear envelope reform around each of these um, right here, and then uh, cytokinesis is going to happen and the cell is going to split. Okay? So that's meiosis 1. Now we're going to go into meiosis 2. So in meiosis 2, no DNA replication has happened. Now these nuclear membranes are going to split. Okay? And if we look at this picture right here, oh, not this one. Well, this is a good picture to show all of meiosis 1. Prophase 1, you've got your homologous chromosomes next to each other. Metaphase 1, they're lined up next to each other, but right down the middle. Anaphase 1, entire set of homologous chromosomes are getting split from one another. Telophase 1 and cytokinesis, the nuclear envelope is reforming. Now, if we go on to prophase 2, you're going to have the same thing. The nuclear envelope is going to be dissolving. Now we have two cells we're talking about because they just split in meiosis 1. And then in metaphase 2, you can see how they're going to line up perfectly up and down just like they do in regular mitosis. But you should notice a difference. And that difference is if you look, this blue chromosome has a little red on it, this red one has a little blue, and that's where that crossing over process has happened. Now in the next slide, you'll see anaphase 2 exactly like mitosis, and then telophase 2 and cytokinesis, giving us one, two, three, four daughter cells. Okay? So the good thing about meiosis 2 is it's pretty much an identical process to regular old mitosis. Um, so let's go to our video and we can watch meiosis 2 happen. So now we've got metaphase happening you've got the chromosomes, the chromatids getting split apart from one another. Then you're going to have a nuclear envelope reform and now you have your four cells that were created as a result of this. Okay. So, final result of meiosis is four cells containing haploid sets of chromosomes. No two are going to be genetically the same due to crossing over. Now in class we can talk about twins and how that happens. So important things that you want to remember about meiosis. Meiosis 1 is separating homologous pairs of chromosomes, and meiosis 2 is separating sister chromatids. So make sure that you read that over and that really makes sense to you. Um, and if we keep on going, the last thing we're going to talk about is, that is a lot of work, isn't it, just to make some gametes. So how did sexual reproduction come to be? So of course we want to talk about what asexual reproduction is first. And that's going to just be where you've got some individual that is going to do budding or something like that where it's going to have an offspring that's basically genetically identical to it. So here you can see this is a hydra 
And here's a little bud coming off of it that's eventually going to break off and become a new hydra. Okay, so that's asexual reproduction. Same thing, redwoods, aspens, they tend to do that. So recombination, or that crossing over we were talking about, can be a disadvantageous type of thing to do. Now, the reason it can be disadvantageous is because if you have someone who has perfect arrangement of genes, like I like to tell my husband I have, um, then when they do crossing over, you're tainting that perfect arrangement of genes, right? And so in that case, it would be better to asexually reproduce. However, sexual reproduction is good because if you have some sort of issue, you can weed it out at some point with sexual reproduction. So the last thing here is why do we have sexual reproduction and how did it come about? So the first idea is a DNA repair hypothesis. And that's saying that in prophase one, when they come together and do that crossing over, perhaps that arose as a way that DNA could actually repair itself by using the other one as a template. So that's one idea. Then you've got the contagion hypothesis, and that's just saying that the origin of sex came from some sort of mobile genetic element. So if you think about sperm, they're mobile, they can move from place to place. Um, and so maybe they were some sort of bacterium or something like that that was a free swimming individual. And then you've got the red queen hypothesis. This one makes the most sense to me. And that's saying that you have dominant and recessive alleles, which we talked about in lab, and perhaps if we have recessive alleles that aren't useful to us now, they can be covered up for a couple of generations and maybe by some crazy chance they could be useful to us later in life. So that's the red queen hypothesis, the saying we can store recessive genes that won't show up until we want them to later through breeding. And then the last one, the Muller's ratchet hypothesis, is talking about the fact that if there is some harmful mutation that shows up in a population that can only do asexual reproduction, they're doomed because they can't weed it out like you could with sexual reproduction. So that's pretty much meiosis, and I hope that kind of made a little sense to you.